Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Express columnist and broadcaster, Karen Malone, who's with me here in the studio, and the Liverpool Echo's political editor, Liam Thorpe, who joins us down the line. Welcome and lovely to see who both of you. Who is sitting in his corridor at home. I know. <laughs> well, why? Yes, where are you, should we ask? I say, I'm, in, I'm in my kitchen, it's just not as nice as Carol's. No, it's not the kitchen. It looks like you're on the way out. Looks <laughs> like there's a door. Carol, he can't help his kitchen. Anyway, to the papers. <laughs> Liam, you can formulate your answer in a minute. Um, anyway, front pages first. The eye leading with the disruption likely to be caused by the decision to close all unsafe school buildings with suspect concrete in danger of collapse. The Guardian describes the situation as the new school year is about to start as chaos. Same lead for the Daily Telegraph, which calls it the return of lockdown. The Times says head teachers were only told about the closures at the very last minute. The Express asks why, if the problem has been known about for so long, it took five years to act. The Daily Mail leads with news of the latest doctor's strike to be called, with the headline, How Callous Can You Get? The Metro covers the death of 22-year-old volunteer soldier Sam Newey in Ukraine. The headline, Brit gave his life to stop Putin. The Financial Times reporting on ethical concerns surrounding the Indian conglomerate Adani, in particular the alleged links between its founder and the country's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Well, more papers still to come in, no doubt. Uh, a reminder, though, for now, scan that QR code you'll see on screen during the programme. You can check out the front pages of the papers while you watch us and listen to our guests. So let's head straight to Liam Thorpe and Carol Malone. Um, Liam, why don't you kick off then? Um, you know, at the 11th hour, these schools being told they have to close because of the fear of this aerated concrete. You know, the question of why such urgency so late for many people? I think that's the, the big question that's going to be asked of the government here. That you know We're just on the eve of the new autumn term starting. There's parents getting their kids ready for school, new kids starting new schools, all the nerves that come with that, and suddenly we're facing this crisis. And I think it is a, a pretty major scandal that, as you say, you know, we could result in thousands of pupils across England already who could face either homeschooling or disrupted learning because of what's going on, what's been found by the government. The, the question is, and the unions are asking, why it's taken so long and why it's why they've had to wait just until the eve of the new term, because these concerns around the material used in the schools have actually been known for some time. It's this kind of material that's been... It was used to build schools both in the 50s and in the 90s, and it, the, the, the problem now is it's, face, it, it's facing a kind of sudden potential collapse, which is obviously extremely dangerous. And the scary thing is, is that while 150 schools have been immediately identified, um, many of them haven't had the surveys done yet. So... Unions have described this as the, the, the tip of the iceberg. So many, many more schools could be closed across the country. And the disruption that, that will have, particularly when you think about what these kids, many of these kids have been through already, who went through the pandemic and are still trying to catch up with the learning that they missed during the pandemic, could be life-changing, really. And I think that there is a major scandal here and the government has dropped the ball. Yeah, and parents um, who can't get to work because they're at home mm. with the kids. Um, testing myself here, reinforced autoclaved aerated yes. concrete is the problem, Google, artist, or, or, or rack. Yep. Um, the problem is, it was back in the late 1990s that we first heard that this had no great life expectancy. So, you know, given not all schools have been surveyed, they went back to 2018 when part of a school collapsed mm -hmm. in Kent, luckily at a weekend. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a slowness to this, isn't there? It's more than that. I mean, this concrete was used in the 50s and 60s, and so the fears were growing over the decades on that, and as you just said there, in, in 1990, it came to a head. You know... The governments, and you can't just blame the Tories, you know, subsequent governments have known about this. And, and, and it just seems astonishing to me that, that, you know, there were 154 schools that were earmarked to, to be fixed immediately. Now, 52 of those have already been fixed. But it strikes me as quite bizarre that if we knew there were another 100 nod to be done, why weren't they doing it at the start of the school holidays when the schools were closed? I mean, this is, as you just touched on there, Anna, this is going to put parents into chaos that's going to make them furious and desperate all at the same time because they're going to have to scramble around making alternative childcare arrangements um, when they don't have time. Some schools go back on Friday. I mean, this is outrageous. And, you know, I think a lot of schools are asked to... So there was a... The government asked for a list of schools, but they've not obviously not been pressing anyone to get this list. And suddenly this is announced today mm -hmm. as the schools are going back. And I think what's really... Um, Shocking. I just read a line in the story tonight on the way in. It says that schools are having to foot the bill for the relocation costs themselves. 
It's not their fault. But there, there seems to be some confusion about that. The um, Department for Education press release said it would be funded, but the uh, guidance gone out to schools suggested they would have to find money for their temporary accommodation. So well, they, they can't buy books. Never mind temporary accommodation. So this is, you know, this is a, this is a whammy for for everyone on every single couch. And what it means is, you know, is if our kids hadn't had enough disruption to their learning, you know, in the pandemic, this is this is going to be. It's you know, I think the Telegraph has described it as lockdown returns. The school should over the fears of collapse. You know, this means that a lot of kids are going to go back to online learning again, and we saw how disastrous that was. Uh, you know, the results are still being felt two, three years later. Um, and, you know, they, they've just almost got back to some kind of normality after the pandemic, and then there's this. It's crazy. Yeah, and the suggestion was there was new evidence. Um, I did read um, one uh, suggestion that officials had found um, potential disintegration in uh, this aerated concrete, which had not actually shown any signs. So even the bit that looks OK isn't OK kind of thing. But who knows what the new evidence is, which would explain this sort of urgency. Um, you know, we're looking at the newspaper, thousands of children face homeschooling, the Daily Telegraph, lockdown returns as schools shut over fears of collapse, um, the Guardian... Uh, uh, school chaos as buildings are shut over collapse fears. I mean, all the schools around me open tomorrow, even yeah. though there's an inset day, so the teachers That's will right. due in at least. And, uh, you know, it, it's just the proximity to the start of term which makes this so extraordinary, Liam. Yeah, as Carol said, you know, they, 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 they have had the perfect time to, to investigate this. You know, schools are closed for six weeks over the summer. So for school leaders and teachers to be getting this information literally a day or days before they're opening the, uh, for the new term and all of the all the stress and, and the worry that comes with that anyway is, is unbelievable, really. And, 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 you know, the unions are saying that that time has been squandered while the government tried to kind of effectively hide or, or keep away the, the reality of what was going on. And then they've been, you know, whatever this new evidence is, whatever these, these surveys are, they've been forced out of a, you know, really pressing emergency because, you know, from what the health and safety executive is saying, is these schools could, some of them could suddenly collapse. It's, it's extremely dangerous. So they've been forced into this at the last minute. But I, I don't know, it feels to me like a kind of sign of a government in disarray that, yes, that obviously these issues can go back many decades in terms of when these buildings were made. But just the lack of organisation, the lack of foresight, the lack of communication from a government and various departments that seem to be fairly chaotic at the moment. And as you say, it's left children and parents and teachers and school staff in, in absolute chaos just days before the term. It's, it's hugely damaging. Yes, let me just read it quick, quickly, before okay. you um, uh, come in, uh, Carol, in The Guardian. Several recent collapses of rack roof panels that appear to be in good condition have made us less confident buildings containing rack should remain open without extra measures in place. So it does, it's a building fear. But the, the, the point is, good surveyors will know all of that. I mean, someone who's going to inspect a building, you know, we're, we're learning it first hand now, but good surveyors will know all that, and they should have been sent in before. But Liam's right, you know, this adds to the the narrative that nothing works in this country, you know? The planes don't work, the trains don't work, you know, the schools aren't working. And it just, you know, we don't seem to... You know, this used to be a country where things got done right and it just doesn't feel like that anymore. And it, it feels like no one gives a stuff if they're done right or not either. And that, and I just, I, you know, I just think you know, the mess over this, this is going to be one of the biggest stories of the next week, I think, because yeah. this disruption is, is catastrophic for families, for kids, for, for schools themselves, for the teachers. It's catastrophic. Mm. And uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the rotation of Secretaries of State as well, which we've seen quite a lot of recently too. Um, in the meantime, let's head to the doctor strike. Um, not any old doctor strike, let's be honest about it. This is a whopper, isn't it, Liam? Uh, with both junior doctors and consultants coordinating their action. Yeah, and it's a, as you say, it's a big one. It is an escalation. It's the first time that junior doctors and uh, consultants have gone out at the same time. And it, it is, you know, as as it is intended to do, it's going to put enormous pressure on the NHS. And, you know, for, uh, Naomi and Carol are going to disagree wholeheartedly about this. But one thing we will agree on is that it will cause a lot of pressure on the NHS and it will lead to further missed appointments. Um, the, the consultants and the junior doctors both believe that their pay and their terms have been eroded massively over the last 10 years or so. And while a lot, a lot of people say, well, doctors earn good money and, and particularly consultants who, who can earn, you know, very good money, they have to dedicate their lives to this. Um, and they believe that, that the conditions are such that people are no longer entering the profession. We've seen 
time and time again, the NHS is absolutely on its knees. I've reported constantly on the, the, the grim situation in our hospitals. And part of the problem here is that people aren't just being attracted anymore to work in the NHS when they can go and get much better terms abroad. I was speaking to a consultant recently, he said he could go and earn much, much more money in, in America or Australia than, the, the, than what he can earn here. And, and that is a real problem. Uh, it's not just about the money that they can take themselves, it's about anywhere. attracting people. You know, presumably they didn't just come into the profession to earn shed loads of money. You know, we keep talking about how badly they're paid. You know, the doctors are holding up the sign that says, you know, £14 an hour or something. You know, let's, let's be really clear about what junior doctors get. At the end of the first year, they're on thirty-seven seven grand a year, which isn't bad. At the end of the second year, they're on forty-three grand, which is actually 10% more than the average wage. So it's not terrible. And within five years, they're on between 56 and 63 grand. But they're, but Still they're, with the title of junior doctor. In Britain with the longest training. That's, well, that's sort of the point, isn't yes, it? And I know a large portion of the salary okay. is on their pension, which is generous. I, well, their pension is hugely generous. They get 20% of their salary goes into their pension, when the average is 5% for everyone. So it's, 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 it's not a bad job. And the, the more experience they get, when they're earning this fit between 56 and 63, they've still got the word junior doctor in their name. When they get on to be more senior than that, we know what the average wage for a consultant is. It's about 128 grand, plus bonuses, plus overtime. It can be 168 grand, plus anything they do on private. These are some of the best paid people in Britain. And, and I know they're bright, and I know they're clever, and all the rest, but we've got to stop using this argument that could, they could get more money elsewhere. Well, then, you know, don't train to be a doctor in this country. Don't use the resources of this country to train and then go to another country it, and give them the But it, it's the unsustainably long working hours and the unsustainable that's, pressure at work, isn't the it? The doctor's life. Yeah, that's, well, what, that's what a doctor does. I'm just going to show you the Telegraph as well quickly. Um, they're suggesting, the suggestion here is that the unprecedented doctor strike is timed... Uh, with the Tory party conference, yeah. quitting a deputy chair of the Conservative Party, uh, saying the timing makes it clear their strike plans are politically motivated. Of course. The party conference will run from Sunday, October the 1st to Wednesday, October the 4th, and a rally uh, is uh, anticipated on the conference's doorstep. Um, Carol, front page of The Guardian, there stands Grant Shapps, yeah. um, a former paper reviewer, uh, like you both, actually, <laughs> on this show, um, but a man um, who can clearly hold down a department, or five, in well, the no, last Well, no, what he months. can't, that's the point, he's not holding anything, no, you're right. Five Five jobs, five cabinet jobs in less than a year. So sorry, I, was, I had to look them up tonight. Now, I, I look, transport, Home Secretary, Energy, Business, Energy and Industry Strategy, whatever that means. And home, now home Secretary was only five days, though, I well, think, wasn't it? Doesn't it doesn't matter. It's a job. Well, <laughs> in your city, you can hold down a job. Let's hope he was a better paper reviewer than he is minister. But it never ceases to amaze me how... I mean, I just think he's a bit of a wimpy politician. I think he's a bum-on-the-fence politician. I think he's been put there because he's a safe pair of hands, and that's not what you need in the Ministry of Defence. You know, for, for, for Shaps to replace a titan like Ben Wallace, a man who, you know, who, who was defend, who, who had been in the military himself, who understood the military, who had massive sympathy, he knew what it needed. And he asked Rishi last year, he wanted between 8 and 11 billion extra, Rishi gave him five, and he said you, you couldn't defend this country with that five. And, of course, he's now gone because he just he couldn't stand it anymore. And they've put this nobody of a minister in who has no experience whatsoever in defence, which is terrifying when you think about it. I mean, defence is arguably one of the most, you know, important officers in the Cabinet because it's the security of our country. And all he will do is do what Rishi tells him, about saving money, and that's and, not what And everyone need. points out the complexity, not least in procurement, which is very complicated. Yes. And yet, Liam, he's been trusted by three different prime ministers, all of a slightly different ilk, if you look at, you know, Rishi, Liz, Boris. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's done something to impress all of them. I think, as, as Carol says, he's, he's seen as a, a safe... <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty underwhelming uh, <laughs> appointment altogether, I think. Um, and, um, you know, someone who Rishi Sunak can rely on, basically. But, yeah, pretty underwhelming, I think. Yeah. Well, putting in an arch loyalist, the suggestion is that there could be another reshuffle and a big one before the Queen's speech uh, later this year in uh, November. So we'll watch and wait for that. Anyway, let's go to the mail. Ooh, uh, like their picture this. story. Yeah. What are we watching? What are we looking at here, Carol? Well, looking, it says here, Loch Ness, the most exciting Nessie pictures ever revealed. Now, I, I, I'm a believer. I want to believe Nessie exists. I'm looking at this, though. And, and, and it looks to me like a couple of bags of offal from the butchers, but I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong. <laughs> I really am. You think it looks like what? I thought it was rocks. Liam, what do you think? It's a seal. 
Is it? <laughs> no, so look, at, no, look at the front of its head. It looks like there's teeth there, but that could, just could be a bit of a plastic bag. I don't know. See, it looks like there's teeth at the front. But, you know, this is great for all the Nessie businesses in Scotland because <laughs> there's going to have a massive upsurge now, thank God, because, you know, sometimes it's not good for them. But I want it to be true. So it's true. And it would be what? A relic dinosaur? It would be a relic dinosaur okay. that's swimming about. There we go. And it's not, it's never, it's never hurt anybody. <laughs> it's got a right to live. <laughs> a happy dinosaur. Yes. Liam and Carol, thank you both very much indeed. Lost cat flyer, lost teddy flyer, lost glasses flyer. George's.